Father, again, we just thank you, Lord, as we gather in this place. Lord, your gifts, Lord, are too numerous to mention. Lord, your mercies too bountiful to comprehend. And yet, Lord, as we gather here, Lord, we're called to give back, Lord, some of that which you give us. Lord, that it might be used for the furtherance of your word, for the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, that others will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour. Lord, that they'll cry out to you in a day. Lord, we don't know when, but they'll cry out to you in a day. Lord, save me. Lord, and you'll hear that cry. Lord, and as he answered it for us, Lord, you'll answer it for them also. But we pray, Lord, that in these things, Lord, that we'll use it wisely, the gifts, the talents that you give us, Lord, because it's for your glory, not about what we can do or say, Lord, but it's to recognize where we've come from, where we are now, and where we're going in the future. And so we thank you for that. We also pray, Lord, for those who undertake your work, Lord, through mission. Lord, where it be in this country, Lord, where it be overseas. Lord, we know that many people, Lord, undertake that work, that calling that you've gave them. Individuals, families, Lord, they're there and they're working for you, Lord. Often they're unseen, often they're unheard of. But Lord, you know each and every one. And so we just pray your hand would be upon them, Lord, that you would lead and guide them especially in this, those countries, Lord, where there's oppression. Lord, it's important we remember these people in our prayers. Lord, it's important that we hand them over to you. Lord, because you know everything in every situation. And so we commend them to you. So we just thank you, Lord, as we get ready to read your word, Lord, and to bring that word that you've laid upon my heart this morning. Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you would help us to have listening ears Lord, and for the challenges that comes through your words, Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you'll help us, Lord, to understand it, to take it in, and to recognise what you're saying to us as individuals and collectively as a fellowship. It's your church. O church, arise. That's the cry. So we thank you for this time. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. It's quite good that the hymns and the choruses, whatever you want to call them, that Janice picked this morning, there's a couple of them tie in with the, with the message this morning because when I was looking at this passage of scripture, I was saying to Jeanette yesterday, it's, it's one of these kind of things that you feel as though you're, you're like a teacher in a classroom, you're getting a history lesson. I don't know if anybody likes history or you are great at history. I must admit I was rubbish at school in a lot of ways. But some subjects I, I, I like, history being one of them. And uh, I feel as though this morning as we go through this passage of the Lord's Word that we see a historical thing in it, but also an application for the church today. And in that hymn we were singing a couple of ones ago, it was talking about, about the history and about the schemes of men and women. And we see the schemes of men and women here. Um, as the, the Lord unfolds his word to us in Isaiah. I hope you're enjoying us because when, when you're preaching, um, you've got to go and look at a lot of things in the Bible. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, so therefore, as a, a direct consequence of that, you get to understand your Bible a wee bit more than what you're maybe just doing it if you were just, say, sitting like yourselves. But we need to study the Bible and understand it and see where God's coming from, what he's doing, and what's going to be happening in the future. And it's really important that we do that. And we've seen in the last sort of four or five weeks various messages regarding the enemies of God's people. And today we're looking at Egypt. You remember last week it was about Ethiopia. I mentioned about a month ago about the various other countries that the Lord's going to be bringing disaster upon, his wrath upon because of their situation. 
But you know something? When you look at all these parts and these chapters, one of the most striking things that we see, especially in this chapter, rather we can on with next week as well, is something that we have to be aware of as a church and as individuals and as families. And that's about alliances. We have to be very careful who we make alliances with. And is it in keeping with God's plan for your own life, for your family's life, and for the church? It's extremely important that we give due deliberation to these things and we pray over them properly, that we understand the mind and the will of God in any decision making that we make and as a church going forward. You know, sometimes when you look at the Bible, God's plans are very, very specific. It gives you an exact date when things will happen. And you see that quite a lot. If you've ever read Ezekiel in the Bible, you'll see quite often it will say, so what's the day, the 2nd of June? On the 2nd of June, 2024, this is what's going to happen. It doesn't say it's going to be last week, next week, yesterday, tomorrow, whatever. It gives you a date, very, very specific. And then when that date comes, it happens. Now, before I was saved, I didn't understand that the Bible was quite as specific as that in many respects, because it will say in the future, in time to come, when the Lord comes back, it doesn't give you a date. Everybody's all trying to second guess what's going to happen when. But in other instances, it's very important that we recognize that there is a date for something and it's coming. We might not know when it is, but the fact remains is it's going to be there. It gives you that exact date when things are going to happen. You know, and see when we've been looking at this, we'll do the reading in a wee minute or two, but see when we've been looking through Isaiah and all the things that's been happening within the chapters that we've read so far, some people would maybe think, you know, you've got Egypt, Moab, uh, Assyria, uh, the Babylonians, you've got the Ethiopians, all these countries and more are all the enemies of God's people. I wonder why God just one day just gather all them together and just say, I'm going to deal with you at the same time in the same way. Do you ever think of that or does your mind not work in that sort of way? Why does God not just deal with all these things at the same time? Well, Oops, that's my phone. Somebody's sending me something. It's normally something for the church, by the way. <laughs> so I don't know what it is. So why does that happen? Why does that happen? What happens here is that God wants the nations of the world to recognize something about him. And that recognition is that he's sovereign. He alone decides what happens. He alone decides when it will happen and he alone will decide to whom it will happen. We can't change it. We think we're maybe changing things but God's sovereign and what he says goes and it doesn't matter about the schemes of men and women and everybody else that they try and put up. None of them will survive. And that's the same as us in our own lives as well because sometimes We might not take God too seriously at times. Maybe something happens and you want to go and do something a wee bit different from what you should be doing in the will of God. And then you go and do that. But you see, he's sovereign. He sees everything that we do. It might not be obvious to the rest of the people in the church. It might not be obvious to somebody you know, your family, your friends, neighbours, whatever. But he knows all about it. And he keeps it all in store. So he does. But thankfully we are in the Lord. And when we know Christ is our saviour, then what happens is that the blood has paid the price. 
to these things that we've done. That doesn't mean to say that we should go out and do what we like, but we've got to be careful about what we're doing. And in this bit of the passage, the people of Egypt and the people of Judah needed to hear this really important message as we do today. And they had to hear it for different reasons. One was God's chosen people and the other was their enemy and God's enemy as well. And when you go back and you look in the early chapters of the Bible, in Genesis going into Exodus, we recall that the Israelite nation were captives and they were enslaved by Egypt for about 400 years. But during that time, they were really cruelly oppressed. They were cruelly treated. And they cried out to God. Have you ever been in a position where you feel as though you're in your terror and you don't know where to turn to next? And you cry out to God and you say, God, help me. And he answers your call. As he answered the call of his people, they prayed to God for deliverance. And he answered them through many miracles. And you can read about that in Exodus. And yet, here we are in this passage of Scripture today in Isaiah. And what's happening now, the arch enemies of the Israelite people, especially Judah in this particular instance, they're considering an alliance with their enemy. And I wonder if you've ever kind of fell out with somebody but you don't like somebody else, you know, a third party, or you don't like something that's happened that a third party's doing to you. And you say, right, okay, I don't like Robert Bill, but I'm quite happy to pally up with him because he doesn't like that other one either. So what the day is, I'll, 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 I'll make an alliance with him, you know, and we're going, going after it. You know, that's what people do. That's what church does. That's what happens within churches, why quite often we split up and we divide. We have two different groups of people and they side with other people. They make alliances with each other. You see it in politics, don't you? And it all comes unfurled. And I don't want to go into politics, but you've seen it just in the recent weeks, recent months in Scotland and also down in the, the national government that we have. They made an alliance with their enemy. Even though all these people in Egypt, and if you've ever been to Egypt, uh, you, you'll know this, they worshipped many idols and they worshipped many gods. But you know, Judah looked at itself in its situation with everybody else and all the armies that were advancing upon them about what was going to be happening in the event. Mm, what do we do here? We're not powerful enough. So what they said was, we'll make an alliance with Egypt and we'll consider that because Egypt it's powerful. It's also wealthy. But you know something as usual in any alliances that you make, the one seeking the alliance, the one seeking something, has to give something up. And that's true today, not only for us, but for the church as well. Over the years, we've seen the church decline. And it's because of many alliances that they've made, the many compromises that they've made, to various groups. And as a consequence, they've no held true to the word of God. And when we make the alliances with the wrong people, God takes action against us. And that's what's happening today. And we see it. And we need to make sure that we are on the right side here. That any alliances that we make are godly alliances. And that we seek his will and his purpose for us. See, the problem that people have got is we're not prepared to wait in God and let them speak to us. Egypt, at the time of the pharaohs, as we know, was a mighty nation. And it still is. Even today, it's quite a powerful nation in its own right, Egypt. Many times we've read of in the past of Egypt as Israel's enemy. But we also see times when it's been a refuge for them. And here we see an offering 
of a tempting alliance. See, the problem with this type of alliance is when it breaks down, somebody will get hurt. As I've said, Egypt and its people were cruel and they were evil. They worshipped idols to the extreme. And as a consequence, God condemned them. And there'll be a day of reckoning coming and a day of judgment coming. And all the people that made alliances with the world and all the compromises that they made in their lives that are outside the kingdom of God in Revelation, we read of that condemnation. It's not something we like speaking about. It's not something we like to hear about. But the fact still remains that it will happen because God will make it happen because of his sovereignty. And that's why as a fellowship it's important for us to go out and share the gospel message with people. A lot of the world is sitting by and saying, oh, things aren't going to get any worse. This is just going to drift on. But as you look at the world today, as you look at the world today and you see the conflict that's happening in various countries, wars are increasing. Death is increasing due to it. And it's because of what's been happening with the people and the alliances that they've made. What happens here? What happened with the condemnation that God put upon Egypt? Well, the Bible tells us that there was a battle way back in 605 BC. And in that battle, the Babylonians came to power. They came to prominence. And what they'd done was they crushed Egypt and they crushed Assyria. These were rivals for world power and world domination. And we still hear about that today. So what I want to do now is I want to read about Isaiah's message concerning Egypt after what we have read. And it's from chapter 19, and it's the first 10 verses. As I say, I uh, think Rod's preaching on the next part of this next week. But let's see what the Lord says to this. And this is Isaiah. This message came to me concerning Egypt. Look, the Lord is advancing against Egypt, riding on a swift cloud. The idols of Egypt tremble. The hearts of the Egyptians melt with fear. I will make Egyptian fight against Egyptian, brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor, city against city, province against province. The Egyptians will lose heart and I will confuse their plans. They will plead with their idols for wisdom and call upon spirits, mediums, and those who consult the spirits of the dead. I will hand over Egypt over to a hard, cruel master. A fierce king will rule them, says the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies. The waters of the Nile will fail to rise and flood the fields. The riverbed will be parched and dry. The canals of the Nile will dry up and the streams of Egypt will stink with rotting reeds and rushes. All the greenery along the river bank and all the crops along the river will dry up and blow away. The fishermen will lament for lack of water. Those who cast hooks into the Nile will groan and those who use nets will lose hearts. There will be no flax for the harvesters, no thread for the weavers. They will be in despair and all the workers will be sick at heart. That's quite a passage just for 10 verses. And as I say, we're going to be looking at disappointment when we gather tonight. Sometimes with disappointment, and you're disappointed and you say, oh, well, I'm disappointed now, but in a wee while I'll get over it and I'll try again or I'll, I'll have another go at something. But see when it just says in that very last line of verse 10, 
they'll be sick at heart. When you lose heart, you just seem to lose everything, don't you? You just don't feel like doing anything at all. And that's what we are guarding against. In verse 1 of this passage, it speaks of the Lord advancing against the Egyptian on a swift cloud. And when I see something like that, this is where the sort of history and when you're looking at different things in the Bible come in. When I see something like that, I say, whoa, clouds. The Lord's coming in a cloud. Where else does it talk about clouds in the Bible? And you go right away back to the beginning again, don't you? To Genesis going into Exodus and the people being freed from slavery. And it tells us that during this Exodus, the people were led by a cloud or a pillar, a pillar of cloud by day. They were led by a pillar of cloud by day. Then in Acts, in chapter 1, the disciples are there and they see Jesus ascending into heaven in a cloud. And the disciples are told that he'll return in the same way. Could you imagine? I don't even know. I don't, I don't even think I can imagine this. I could see the picture in my mind. But I can't imagine what I'd be feeling like at the time. Could you imagine if you're one of the disciples there at that time and all of a sudden you see the Lord going up in a cloud ascending to heaven? Can you imagine that in your mind's eye? I can't imagine that. I've, my my imagination is quite good, but it's no, no that good. But then it tells us that he's going to come back in the same way. And remember in Revelation, in chapter 1, it says he comes with the clouds of heaven. When he comes back to judge the world, and as I say, that's fact, he's sovereign, and the people that have not been living the lives that they should have been living are no accepted Christ as a saviour, when he comes back, the consequences for them is untold. We read about it, but we can't imagine it. He says, when he comes with the clouds of heaven, conquering evil, judging all the people according to their deeds, when we read in this passage today, no wonder, no wonder that the idols of Egypt tremble and the hearts of the people melt with fear. In verse 2, <coughs> it says, I will make Egyptian a fight against Egyptian, brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor, city against city, the provinces against the provinces. It starts right at the root. It starts with an individual. And then it progresses. It involves somebody else. And then it involves a family. And then it involves the wee village. And then it involves the town. And then it involves the city. And then it involves the rest of it. And what happens is that it spreads out. It spreads out. See, the country of Egypt was split into a number of areas. And each of these areas would have its own ruler. But it's always, always the case. There's always somebody a wee bit more powerful than what you are. And then that person, there's somebody also a wee bit more powerful than what they are. And so therefore, as a consequence, there was rivalry between the various areas. And we see that in many places in the world today. You get civil unrest that starts. You know, it starts with a, a demonstration. You see it in the news, and it's a kind of peaceful demonstration. And then what happens is that they're having a demonstration next month again and you get people who infiltrate it. Troublemakers, problem makers, people that want to cause chaos and anarchy. And then the next time it gets a wee bit more severe, the police are all involved and people are getting arrested, people are getting hurt. And what then happens is when that civil unrest starts, 
and it's not checked, it then leads to a civil war. Starting in this case, with the families and the neighbours, they fight with each other, and it leads to provinces fighting against each other. See, in this type of conflict, there are no winners. At least the destruction, at least the desolation, and at least the disappointment. And you only have to look at the war in the Middle East. You see the destruction, you see the desolation, and you see the, the disappointment. Now, whether or not you agree with that is not really relevant too much. What I'm trying to say is that you can see it with your own eyes the desolation the destruction and the disappointment in both sides. Even today, in this place this morning, you and I will know families that have fallen out because someone said something or somebody's done something and disappointment results. I mentioned before, I had, I've got... Uh, I had two brothers, one of them's died now. But my two brothers fell out about a fence between the garden. You know, a wooden fence. Unbelievable. They fell out about it. Then they talked for donkeys. <laughs> and they lived next door to each other at that time. But you don't know people within your own families. Or your friends or your neighbours. But they fell out with each other over the stupidest of things disappointment in both sides of the camp because often no one wants to give in to the other side and what happens it ends up with groups of people you're fractured who cannot and will not be reconciled you know we have to keep accounts with others short bitterness and resentment are powerful destroyers in verse 3, it says the Egyptians will lose heart and I will confuse their plans. They will plead with their idols for wisdom and call on spirits, mediums, and those who consult the spirits of the dead. As I was saying earlier, you can face disappointment at times and hopefully you'll get over it in a period of time. There's a healing process and you'll try again or whatever. But as I say, when you lose heart, not only is your mental health affected, but your physical body is affected by it as well. It drags you right down to the depths. And it's trying to stop that. It's trying to stop that. We see the Egyptian people here. It says that they lost heart. And they consulted their idols. Now, I don't know but if you've ever lost heart in your life, if you've been in a real difficult period, you know, and you say, where can I turn to? And you try everything under the sun. It might be medication, it might be counselling, it might be something else. But has it helped you to the degree that you need your help for? These people consulted their idols to see what their next move was. And the lines between people and their false gods. The false gods who could do nothing for them. I would say to you as the day, don't make the same mistake in creating an alliance with worldly items or worldly views or worldly thoughts because it will do nothing for you. Don't make that same mistake. God will destroy these as with all the other idols. My trust and your trust should be in him alone. And nothing is able to deal effectively with the judgment that will come from God. When that judgment comes, you're not going to be able to take an anodin for your sore head or something that's going to make you stop feeling sick. There's no remedy in the market it will deal with that it will be swift it will be sudden and it will be terrible 
that judgment will come in his time. When we look at verse 4, it says, The Egyptians will lose heart and I will confuse their plans. They will plead with their idols for wisdom and call on spirits, mediums, and those who consult the spirits of the dead. And then it says, I will hand over to a hard, cruel master. A fierce king will rule over them, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, I don't really know who this cruel king is going to be or the cruel master. It could be a reference. It could be a reference to Nebuchadnezzar. You remember, I was saying earlier about the battle in 605, it was a place called Kermish. And what happened was that the, the, the people were obliterated there. Or it could be somebody within the Egyptian camp who is an heir or has some sort of hereditary function or right that they'll bring up in the future that will make them the person that's in charge. But irrespective of who it actually is, it says that there will be a cruel master, a hard, cruel master, a fierce king will rule him because God has ordained that. From verses 5 to 10, you stick them up, Nicole. From verses 5 to 10, it talks about the waters of the Nile. And this is really an important aspect to uh, what we're looking at this morning. When you look at the waters of the Nile, I don't know if you've ever been there, as I say, um, we, we, we've been down the River Nile, but it's got a lot of tributaries that come together and, and make the, the, the river. And it's talking about all these things here. It talks about the waters of the Nile, it's plural. So it's talking about all those that feed into the Nile and make it the river itself. You know, the river, the Nile was famous and it still is. And in those days and even today, it symbolizes, in a way, wealth, strength. But the natural habitat that grows at the side of all these tributaries and everything else was fantastic. It was all created because of the water. Everything that was growing to feed the country depended on the volume of water needed to produce the harvest. And if that dried up, the land would become barren. Let's just have a quick read at this. It says, The waters of the Nile will fail to rise and flood the fields. The riverbed will be parched and dry. The canals of the Nile will dry up. And the streams of Egypt will stink with rotting reeds and rushes. All the greenery along the riverbank and all the crops along the river will dry up and blow away. The fishermen will lament for lack of work. Those who cast hooks into the Nile will groan. And those who you nets Use nets will lose heart. There'll be no flax for the harvesters, no thread for the weavers. They will be in despair. And all the workers will be sick at heart. When you go back to Genesis, uh, to chapters 41 and 42, and this is where again a bit of history comes in. You know, we read about Joseph. He was in Canaan. His brothers tried to do him in. He got escaped and he went to Egypt. And then what happened was he was made the ruler of Egypt. And he spoke of at that time that there was going to be seven years of plenty. Then after that seven years of plenty, there was going to be seven barren years when famine was going to come into the country. And what happened was that the Pharaoh at that time says, whatever Joseph says goes, okay? Whatever he says, do it. And in the seven great years, it, it stored everything all up. And then when the famine came, the people from Canaan or Israel had to go way down to Egypt to try and buy grain. It was the only place that had any food. They had no food, so they had to depend on Egypt to buy food. And it was only could be done because of the Nile. Now, we read that the waters of the Nile would fail to rise and flood the, feed, the fields. Not only that, it helped the enemies with low water. Craig and I go fishing, as you know, and he's know. And sometimes when we're away fishing, we can go to a place and we can walk across a river and we're relatives. Sometimes we go to that place and we need to wear a pair of waders 
and the, the water's up to our waist or higher, crossing the river. And other times, the speed of the current could take you away. We see here that it was much easier to attack Egypt because the water was so low and the ground parts in many areas that armies could actually walk over and could advance on the main cities of that. You know, but all of this was done by the hand of God. Fishing was a big food source for the people, but nothing. But now we find that those who cast the hooks in the nets are going to lose heart. Great disappointment will come upon them. No fish, no income, no life. And we saw the disappointment with the people of Israel. In the book of Numbers, I'm going to ask Nicole to stick this up and we'll have a wee read at this. This is in the book of Numbers. This is about the, the Exodus and everything else. It said, soon the people began to complain about their hardship. And the Lord heard everything they said. Now take note of that. Everything that you say, the Lord hears everything. Then the Lord's anger blazed against them and he sent a fire to rage among them and he destroyed some of the people in the outskirts of the camp. That's his own people. Then the people screamed to Moses for help. And when he prayed to the Lord, the fire stopped. God answered the prayer. After that, the area was known as Tabra, which means the place of burning, because fire from the Lord had burned among them there. Then the foreign rabble, remember the alliances, people come in, there's a wee civil rights demonstration, you get the rabble coming in, they want to upset the apple cart. So what happens is these people then start joining the crowd who were travelling with the Israelites and they began to crave the good things of Egypt. Now remember they've been enslaved there 400 years under a cruel master and getting treated real badly. But they began to crave for the good things. It shows you where your place goes, doesn't it? When your life falls apart. And the people of Israel also began to complain over some meat they exclaimed. We remember the fish we used to eat free in Egypt and we all had the cucumbers the melons, the leeks, the onions and the garlic we wanted, all the stuff produced by the Nile but now our appetites are gone and all we ever see is this manna they weren't happy with their lot, one complaint after another, one disappointment after another, they were in despair and we see the despair here in verse 10 as I say, Egypt was famous for its manufacturing of products, flax, thread, cotton. You know, Solomon even sent his uh, merchants to buy linen from Egypt. But now there was no work for these trades. You know, God can find ways to deprive a country of its basic requirements. And he can do the same with us today. The making of a nation depends much upon the people. Things are likely to do well when we not only work together, but when we do the work to glorify God, unification, alliances in the right place, a right relationship with each other and God, we succeed. When we take God out of the situation, we may still think we're doing well, but it's outside of his will. We need to work with each other in God's way to receive God's blessing and to avoid that feeling of despair and disappointment and be happy with what God has done for you and given you on a daily basis. One thing to remember, if nothing else, when you go away from here, there is no permanence apart from God. There is no permanence apart from God. Everything will be taken away and only those that are true to him will be with them. Let's pray. Father, again, we just thank you for this time. <clears throat> Lord, we pray that you'll help us to understand, Lord, where we are, what our situations are, what our thought processes are, because we want to serve you. But Lord, we know that the world tries to make us, to make compromises. Lord, that makes us look as though we're happy in that situation but we've turned from you. 
Lord, we just pray that you'll turn our eyes back to you and you'll help us and lead us and guide us in everything that we do to worship you and to praise you. In your name we pray, amen.